Hey, 42 here. Scotland, a land where tartan is the height of fashion. People throw tree trunks for fun, and ground up sheep's innards are considered a national delicacy. Oh, and they also call lakes locks. And when it comes to locks, Scotland has a lot of them. So many that an exact count has never been made though it's estimated there are more than 30,000 in total, ranging from pint-sized Loch Hands to mighty behemoths like Loch Lomond. So, it probably shouldn't come as any surprise that a country containing so many vast, foreboding bodies of water is rich with tales of water-dwelling monsters. Take the Kelpie, for example, a shape-shifting horse-like creature that entices unsuspecting victims to climb onto its back before charging them into the watery depths and drowning them. Or the Blue Men of Minch, evil mermen who dwell in underwater caves waiting to capsize passing boats. But of course, one Scottish folktale reigns supreme. I am, of course, talking about the Loch Ness Monster, a creature that has become as synonymous with Scotland as bagpipes, haggis, and kilts. So, how exactly did the Loch Ness Monster become the granddaddy champion of Scottish folklore? Well, all it took was a hippopotamus, a surgeon, and a toy submarine. But more on that later. As far as hiding places go, a monster could do much worse than Loch Ness. For a start, not only is the water almost completely black due to the high levels of peat, it's also pretty bloody deep. So deep, in fact, that if you were to place the Great Pyramid of Giza at the loch's deepest point and have the Statue of Liberty climb on top, her torch would only just break the surface. And if you don't think that's impressive enough, Loch Ness holds about 7.5 million cubic kilometres of water, which is more than all of the lakes in England and Wales combined. That's a lot of water for a secretive beastie to hide out in. For the most part, sightings of Nessie started relatively recently, towards the end of the 19th century. But some people believe the evidence goes back much further than that, all the way to the Picts, a confederation of tribes who inhabited much of Scotland during the early Middle Ages. Although dismissed by the Romans as savages, the Picts were actually rather cultured, and when they weren't engaging in the occasional barbaric scuffle, they enjoyed nothing more than making pretty carvings of the flowers and animals that surrounded them. One of these carvings, which has come to be known as the Pictish Beast, appears to depict some kind of aquatic creature. But what exactly? Some have suggested it's a porpoise, or a dolphin, maybe even a swimming elephant. But with its elongated neck and what appears to be flippers, you have to admit it bears more than a passing resemblance to a certain lock-dwelling creature. Of course, it's probably just a coincidence, but if it is, it's a weird one. And that isn't the only evidence of an unidentified aquatic creature living near Loch Ness in the Middle Ages. A biography of Saint Columba, written in 565 AD, speaks of an incident in which the saint encountered a mysterious water beast that had recently killed a local villager. It should be noted that this incident took place in the River Ness, and not the loch itself. But River Ness Monster doesn't quite have the same ring to it, does it? In spite of the Pict's mysterious carvings, and St. Columba's heroics at the River Ness, it wasn't until a sighting in 1933 that most people really started entertaining the idea that there could be a monster living in that yonder loch. And... Oddly enough, this sighting actually took place on land. As George Spicer and his wife drove by the lock one evening, they were startled by what they described as most extraordinary form of animal, walking across the road in front of them. The creature was said to have a large body and a long, wavy neck. As they drove closer, George noted that it carried in its mouth what appeared to be the carcass of a lamb. After a report of the sighting was published in the press, 
people began descending on the lock, hoping to see the monster for themselves. Sightings of the beast began to stack up, and pretty soon, Nessie fever had gripped the nation. Desperate to bag the scoop of the century, the Daily Mail newspaper recruited a renowned big game hunter, with the exceptional name of Marmaduke Weverell, to travel to Loch Ness and track down this elusive beast. And, at first, it appeared Weverell was about to do just that. After only a few days of monster hunting, he found unusual footprints embedded within the banks of the loch. He declared that they belonged to a very powerful, soft-footed animal about 20 feet long. He made casts of the prints and sent them to the Natural History Museum to be identified. But when the museum announced their verdict, the news wasn't good. The footprints didn't belong to a Loch Ness monster, but to an altogether more common beast, a hippopotamus. Of course, whilst hippos are fairly common, you don't tend to find many of them in Scotland. So what was this particular specimen doing so far from home? Unfortunately, the answer isn't quite as exciting as you might think, and is actually kind of grim. The prints had been made using a hippo foot ashtray. That's quite literally a hippo's severed foot with an ashtray mounted on top. Not the kind of thing I imagine would fly off the shelves today, but back then, they were all a rage. Weverell's reputation was left in tatters. It's unclear whether or not he planted the footprints himself, or if he'd fallen foul of a prank. But neither option left him looking all that good. Either way, the Nessie bubble had burst, and it was going to take something incredible to reignite public enthusiasm. You know, something like someone taking an actual photograph of a monster in Loch Ness. And, as it happens, that's exactly what happens next. The following year, a surgeon by the name of Robert Kenneth Wilson was standing by the lock, thinking about whatever it is surgeons think about on their days off, when he spotted a dinosaur-type creature sticking its head out of the water. Fortunately, Wilson had his camera at the ready. The image Wilson captured would come to be known as the Surgeon's Photograph, and it's probably the most famous Nessie photo in existence. Although lacking in detail by today's standards, many were convinced of its authenticity. After all, this was a time before Photoshop and CGI, a time when people truly believed that cameras never lied. For many, the surgeon's photograph provided irrefutable proof that there really was a monster living in Loch Ness. Now that it appeared there might be some truth behind the many sightings that had been reported, some began to speculate as to what kind of animal the Loch Ness monster might be. The most prominent explanation was that Nessie was descended from a lineage of plesiosaurs that somehow survived the KT extinction event that wiped out the dinosaurs 66 million years ago and adapted to life in Bonnie Scotland. The idea that something thought to have been extinct for millions of years might be discovered alive and kicking today might seem ludicrous, but it has actually happened before. Scientists only knew of the existence of coelacanths, a type of fish they presumed had gone extinct during the Cretaceous period, through fossils up to 410 million years old. And then, someone found one, swimming off the coast of Africa in 1938. So, with that in mind, could a plesiosaur really be lurking in Loch Ness? Well, the honest, slightly boring answer is no, probably not. For a long time, scientists assumed plesiosaurs could never have survived in Loch Ness because it was believed they were cold-blooded and therefore needed relatively warm water to thrive. Scottish lochs have a lot of things going for them, but paddling temperatures isn't one of them. But recent research suggests plesiosaurs may well actually have been warm-blooded blowing that particular argument out of the freezing cold Scottish lock water. 
sadly, that doesn't make the plesiosaur theory any more likely. After all, to have survived the last 66 million years, a whole colony of those beasts would need to be down there. Not only would it be pretty difficult for a large number of giant reptiles to hide in Loch Ness without modern technology being able to locate them, we'd also expect to find plenty of plesiosaur bones littering the loch's depths. And we haven't. The truth is, beyond a few random sightings over the years, there is precisely zero evidence that there's anything in Loch Ness other than fish and a few thousand empty bottles of iron brew. But if not a plesiosaur, then what exactly did Wilson take a photo of? Well, in 1994, 60 years after the photograph was taken, two gentlemen named David Martin and Alistair Boyd made it their mission to find out exactly that. And what they discovered was a lot stranger than you might have imagined. The two men were members of a research team based in Loch Ness, and they were keen to prove once and for all whether the surgeon's photo was authentic. Boyd was further buoyed, see what I did there, by his own sighting of Nessie some years earlier, and he was desperate to know for certain if Wilson really had photographed a Locke's resident monster. The pair had recently come into possession of a newspaper article from 1975 in which it was alleged the photo had been the result of an elaborate hoax. For whatever reason, the article hadn't received much attention at the time of its publication, but Martin and Boyd felt it warranted further investigation. And so began decades of dedicated research, with the pair risking life and limb to uncover the truth. Actually, that's not true at all. They simply followed some basic leads that led them to an elderly Scottish man named Christian Spurling. When they asked Spurling if he knew anything about the photograph, without hesitation he told them the alleged monster, the most treasured Nessie photo in Scotland, was nothing more than a bit of wood mounted on top of a toy submarine. And how did Spurling come by this startling information? Simple. He'd built that model himself at the request of his stepfather, who was none other than our old friend Marmaduke Weverall. You see, Weverall had been so embarrassed by the hippo print fiasco and his treatment at the hands of the Daily Mail that he'd set out to exact his revenge by fooling the press into believing there really was a Loch Ness monster. After Spurling had finished building his model, his father had taken it to Loch Ness, where he'd enlisted the help of his other son, Ian Weverell. Once they'd made sure nobody else was around, the conspirators snapped a few photographs of Spurling's creation bobbing around in the water. They gave the results to their friend, the surgeon, Robert Wilson, because Weverell felt Wilson's reputable profession meant there was less chance of the photograph's authenticity being brought into question. The prank was far more successful than any of them could ever have hoped. The press took the bait, and the rest is history. In more recent times, robotic submersibles, sonar equipment, and drones have all been used in an attempt to find Nessie. But as yet, nobody's been able to provide any solid evidence of her existence. In 2019, researchers attempted to catalogue all living species within the loch by extracting DNA from the water. Their results showed no evidence of anything out of the ordinary, with only a giant eel being put forward as a possible explanation for the many sightings over the years. Despite a lack of hard evidence, Loch Ness continues to attract millions of people every year, who arrive from all corners of the globe, hoping to catch a glimpse of the enigmatic creature. And although Nessie might not make an appearance, the dark and mysterious waters of Loch Ness continue to enchant and captivate people, just the way they did thousands of years ago. Thanks for watching. Good news, you can now pre-order my new book, Bread and Circuses. What did the Romans ever do for us? 
It's a wild and witty journey for a thousand years of unexpected Roman history, told in a refreshing way and packed full of incredible and unbelievable stories. Copies are selling out fast, so pre-order yours today to lock it in. Thank you.